So, yes, my name is Nicole Clements. I am the watershed coordinator for the Banklick Watershed Council. Um, I was asked today to present on a program for detention basin retrofitting and the partnerships that we have within the Banklick Watershed. If you haven't heard of us, the Banklick Watershed Council, we were formed in 2002. We are a volunteer uh, board and we are a nonprofit. Um, and we developed a watershed action plan back in 2005 for the Banklick Creek Watershed. That was later in 2010 um, modified into a, a full size watershed plan that was um, eligible then that met all the requirements for 319 funding. So, as you can see on the map down here, Banklick Watershed is um, very top in northern Kentucky. We're located just across the Ohio River from downtown Cincinnati. Um, so the Bank Lake watershed um, is about 58 square miles. Uh, the main stem is 19.2 miles long. It runs in a northward direction. So from the bottom of your screen up towards the top. Um, as I mentioned, it, it heads towards downtown Cincinnati. So when this watershed was developed, we have an urban core down here in the bottom third of the watershed. And then as development progressed, it went up the watershed. So the middle section of the watershed is largely suburban, single family family residential, and then in the top headwaters of the watershed, um, there's still there's still agriculture up there, but it's predominantly um, it's we're seeing a lot of conversion over to single family residential up there too. So really, when you when you look at the Banklick watershed, we run the full gamut of um, water quality problems or challenges from the agricultural to the suburban to the um, urban areas with CSOs and SSOs. But specifically, our, our pollution problems, we are 303 delisted for fecal coliform nutrients, organic enrichment, and sediment. Um, we do have flooding issues. Obviously, when you develop the lower reaches before the headwaters, um, once you get to development of the headwaters, that sends more water downstream, inundating those already developed areas. So um, those communities down there where they've already put in their homes, their roads, their bridges, their utilities, their infrastructure along those low-lying creek beds, they tend to have issues with, with flooding. Um, but they also, and this is the third bullet here, they also have significant problems with erosion and stormwater management. That issue is really seems to be one of the more predominant issues that we're facing with the watershed and what we seem to be spending a lot of time on here lately. So as, as water quality advocates, we all know that as you have land use changes, you're going to have more runoff, you're going to have faster runoff, right? So that when you get those flows coming into your creek, it's going to cause erosion of the stream bed and erosion of the stream bank. When you start experiencing that excessive erosion, you then see that instability of the creek channel. The creek starts to adapt and move and alter its flow to accommodate those additional inputs, right? So I think you guys have covered this before. This is that channel evolution model um, where you start at stage one, where your creek starts at equilibrium. When it receives additional flows, it will it will adjust. It will first it will get deeper. It will incise. In stage three, it will start to widen. In stage four, you'll start getting some uh, deposition and aggradation happening, and then eventually that stream will completely adjust to those new inputs and ultimately reach a a new state of dynamic equilibrium. We find that in northern Kentucky, our streams, you know, really do follow this this channel evolution model. Um, but in these urbanized areas, where you're continually having new development diff and differing inputs coming in, our our creeks tend to get stuck here in the middle on stage two, three, and four, which means that we we are continually um, seeing. Uh, more erosion, more incision, more widening of those creeks and and really that's problematic when you're in urban areas. This is what we deal with um, and it's pretty typical for the Banklick watershed. This this top picture, this is along our main stem about midway in the watershed. You can see how much how deep and steep the creek banks are and you can see how the creek is pushing in and just consuming that roadway there. This um, second picture in the middle, that is one of our tributaries. Um, that roadway there is one of the main arterials up to our hospital facility. And so this presents concerns in terms of, you know, washing out and destabilizing um, even small roadways. This bottom picture, you'll see on the very edge of your screen there, that concrete structure, that is a sewer manhole. I promise you it was not installed there in, in that way. 
it, those were initially stalled next to the creek bank outside of the creek, buried. Um, but as time progressed, the creek got deeper, it got wider, and it started to erode all of the soil around that manhole. So that now we have manholes like this soldier standing smack dab in the middle of our creeks, um, you know, just waiting there for the next big boulder to be brought down and for to take out that manhole. So we have some um, serious infrastructure concerns as it relates to erosion in our watershed. People start seeing this and you can really start to visualize when the roads get washed out, when the sewers become unstable and start having issues. It also presents a significant cost to the community. So at one point we, we attempted to put some numbers to that. Um, and we found that in 2011, the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet spent $3.1 million in repairing roads that were impacted by erosion in the Kenton County watershed. Granted, 2011 was a, was a really wet year, but um, you know those are some significant costs to the community. In the Dry Creek watershed, which is adjacent to the Bank Lake watershed, um, there was $2.6 million spent in sewer repairs over the last seven years. The Dry Creek watershed is home to our waste, regional wastewater treatment plant. So if you imagine we have all of our regional sewer lines coming into that one area and a creek that is destabilizing those sewers. So that's where we get into our partnership with the Sanitation District Number 1 of Northern Kentucky. SD1 is the regional wastewater and stormwater utility for both for all Boone, Kenton and Campbell counties. And, and really they started to realize that um, stream erosion and this channel instability presented a clear risk to their infrastructure. And that the repairs and the I would say repetitive repairs to that infrastructure and trying to stabilize their, their lines was having a significant financial impact. So back in 2009, Matt Wooten, who is SD1's aquatic biologist, uh, led a project to investigate and research um, the uh, channel instability within Northern Kentucky. They collected hydro hydrogeomorphic data at over 61 locations, twice, sometimes three times annually. They looked at cross sections, longitudinal profiles, bed material composition. And what they did is they were tracking and documenting the erosion and the movement of streams in Northern Kentucky. What they were able to establish was that conventional urban development, even with post construction stormwater controls, was altering the flow regime within our creeks essentially hydro modification, right? We could now point to hydro modification as the cause of the stream erosion and channel instability. As part of their research, they also identified uh, at what point our creeks begin to erode. Um, so if you think about it, you know, the creeks can take a certain amount of flow before you start seeing that bed movement. So there's a threshold at which that erosion begins to occur. So they, they designated this the critical flow rate, and they did all these calculations over here with all these different parameters, put it in that black box, and came up with 0.4 CFS per acre per drainage area. That's what our creeks can handle before they start to erode. Any flows above that threshold, we were seeing erosion. SD1, to their credit, took that information and they, they uh, revised their rules and regulations for stormwater management, such that as of um, 2015, any new detention basins must consider erosion as part of their design calculation and incorporate this concept of critical flow. But what that does is that begs the question of what about all those years and years of traditional stormwater management where we were putting in basins um, where the objectives were um, controlling peak flows, right? We were always looking at peak flow to minimize downstream flooding. That was that traditional philosophy. Um, here's a, a generalized hydrograph and, and you know, that, that philosophy was, well, you know, you don't want these big red peaks up here. You want to squash down that red peak so it becomes this green peak, so you match that pre-development flows. So your, your peaks don't exceed pre-development. Now, if you take what we know about erosion and you put this dashed line across the hydrograph saying, okay, this is where we know erosion will begin to occur. What you notice is when you squash down that line and it becomes the green line, 
you are extending the amount of time that those creeks are receiving erosive flows. So in this hydrograph, if you look pre-development, you'd be at like 50 minutes of erosive flows. Um, Post-development would put you at 60, but when you squash down that peak, you're extending that hydrograph out to a good 110 minutes of erosive flows that were entering our creeks. So not, not only were our, our traditional approaches not addressing channel instability or hydro modification, we were actually elongating um, the, the duration of those uh, erosive flows. So, you know, it begs the question of, you know, oh gosh, could we be making that, that problem worse? So what we did is we said, okay, well, let's go back and look at our existing detention basins and see if we can retrofit those um, with an eye towards this um, erosion factor, right? What if we can go back into these detention basins, retrofit them so that they have more of a natural flow regime, maybe not pre-development, but um, at least um, try and allow that creek that is stuck here in this middle cycling between incision and uh, widening. Um, maybe what we can do is get it at least a little bit more natural so we can let that creek in essence, heal itself and kick itself out down to a state of equilibrium. That would allow those creeks to stabilize themselves so we no longer would have that movement of our creek. So how do we do this? What, what approach do we take to um, retrofitting the detention basins? What's going to be the most effective approach? We started looking at this in 2014 with a pilot project. We completed two very different styles of detention basin retrofit to compare these different approaches. The first one was a biodetention retrofit. This was a modification of the outlet control structure, but it also included excavation and grading, under drains, engineered soils, filter fabric, native plants. I mean, it, it, it was the whole kit and caboodle. It's, it's our Cadillac version of retrofitting, if you will. We took that catalog version and we were comparing it to a very simplified retrofit approach that just modified that outlet control structure. Here's what those projects look like. The bioretention retrofit, this is the before picture. You can see in the schematic off to the right, um, what we did is we raised the elevation of that control tower such that um, we raised the height of it and we could use more capacity in that basin, right? We also put in this wonky shaped T-shaped window into it and connected it to undergrain, under drain. <clears throat> you can see that this project, it involved a bunch of heavy machinery, a bunch of materials, lots of excavation, lots of work. And here's our final product. Here's that heightened basin there with the funky T-shaped window. We have native, or I'm sorry, engineered soils and native plants in that project. Um, that project came in at a whopping 70, $72,000 for construction. So what we did is that we then compared that to a simplified retrofit approach. In this particular basin, the outfall is down at the bottom of your screen here, and it flows across these rocks into an 18-inch low flow pipe. The outlet control structure is located there on the, the hillside behind it. As you can imagine, the flows coming in here basically rip straight across and out that 18-inch low flow pipe. There wasn't much attenuation of flows in this basin. So what we did, and when I say simplified, I'm saying this is a super simple project, right? We took a steel plate and we bolted it to the front of that 18 inch pipe. We restricted that pipe opening from 18 inches down to a six inch opening. So essentially what we're doing is we, we are now catching those small to medium sized storms. So we're using that basin more often and holding that those flows for a little bit while longer. Now we don't want to overtop the basin. So what we do is we wanna make sure that there, we do calculations and make sure that there is enough um, uh, flow so that the, the heavy storms are allowed to pass through this system. And in this case, this design required us to um, add in an additional um, window into the outlet control structure. You can see on the bottom there where it looks like the concrete was cut out into a little um, four inch um, slot there. So this project installation consisted of a big steel plate and a couple of guys with a concrete saw out there cutting an, uh, another window in that outlet control structure. So this simplified approach was a mere $4,000. 
We did modeling of these two different projects um, before we implemented to see what our results would be. Um, as you can see, the biggest difference is going to be the price. We both projects achieved a reduction in our peak flow rates. Um, we also did downstream modeling with a sediment transport model to see what the in-stream benefits would be. Both of those projects showed significant in-stream benefits as well. Um, the simplified approach actually even we were able to achieve um, pre development conditions on on that sediment transport model. So both approaches were were very successful. Um, the bioretention approach does potentially provide additional benefits in terms of uh, maybe volume reduction and water quality treatment with the addition of those soils and plants. Um, you could also has that um, aesthetic benefit as well. Um, but being a nonprofit and with our focus really being on on stream stabilization, we were focused in on, you know, what the benefits of the hydro modification were and the cost of the, the different projects. The Bank Lake Watershed Council moved forward with detention basin retrofitting. It's we really consider it a, a key tool in our toolbox for really um, achieving hydrologic restoration in urban areas. Um, with these simplified projects, they're, they're easy, they're quick, it's a sustainable approach that allows us to address erosion concerns and sediment within our waterways. Um, there are detention basins all around our watershed. We estimate something like 165 different detention basins. And at the cost, it's just really um, an effective way to, to start healing our streams. You know, if you think about it, when, when we want to go in and we want to repair and restore our streams, you know, what do we start with, right? Well, starting with the hydrology really provides that foundation for us. If we were to go in and do things like um, repairing corridor plantings or things like that, while our creeks are still eroding, that's obviously not going to be effective. So from the Watershed Council's side of things, you know, we can achieve a water quality benefit and we can also achieve that stability that we need to then be able to to really achieve some true restoration of that channel. So far, we've completed nine of these projects. Um, we've been able to get the cost for these projects down to, for both design and construction, down to $3,500 to $10,000. We only hit that $10,000 mark when we have to add um, height to those, those outlet control structures. We typically start with about five or six potential projects and doing a desktop analysis and looking at them. Um, that allows us to kind of identify some potential candidates. Um, we look at as built, we look at GIS, and then we go out in the field and field verify. Usually that five or six will be down to two or three good potential candidates um, once we are able to do the field verification process. So right now we're we're kind of in a holding pattern. We're not doing any of these currently because SD1 is in the process of wrapping up a large regional opportunities analysis. They are looking across all three counties in Northern Kentucky for detention basin retrofitting opportunities, identifying um, areas of need, and then they are looking at strategic and prioritized implementation of those basins. So we're kind of waiting to see their data, their priorities, and see how the Watershed Council can maybe utilize some of that information. Obviously, SD1's prioritization might skew more towards infrastructure risk reduction, um, but we can still glean information from that in identifying where some potential opportunities might be and the relative benefits that they would have towards our watershed health. So um, some of the lessons learned along the way, if you're considering projects like this or working in the, um, an urban area like this, um, first of all, ownership is extremely important. We've been able to achieve what we have because of our partnership with SD1. Um, they have owned all of the structures that we've worked on so far, and they have easements to go in to access those, those facilities. So we utilize their easements and their infrastructure to be able to implement these projects. That way we minimize um, issues with private landowners and ownership rights and things like that. We also look at landowner impacts. You know, there will be more frequent water in the basin and a slower release. So we want to make sure we're not going to um, disrupt any of the surrounding properties or neighbors. We also have to look at maintenance of the structure in the basin since um, there will be more water and more backing up. You know, who's going to be responsible for maintaining those once these are installed? 
like I said, when we start our analysis, not, we find that not all basins qualify. The, the candidate basins really have to have excess capacity that we can utilize to, to um, help hold more water back. Um, not all of them have that excess capacity, and so they're not potential candidates. The other problem that we've run into is that when you look at as built and then you go out in the field, sometimes what was installed is not really what was designed. Um, in some cases, you know, a potential basin might be a third of the size that it was supposed to be, or it um, doesn't meet current flood control standards. So we've run into issues along the way um, and, and been able to flag some potential concerns there. And I can't stress enough that modeling is important, not just for the basin selection, but also for evaluating potential basins on their benefit costs and what downstream benefits they might have. The modeling will also help you define your goals for us. You know, our big concern right now is channel stability and preventing erosion, right? If your area is more concerned about volume reduction or water quality improvements, that might push you more towards a, a bioretention approach than just the simplified approach that we have of, of putting these steel plates over the um, low flow structures. I will say one of the, the things that was essential to making this happen was our partnership with SD1. Um, really, the Bank Lake Watershed Council can't do anything without the partners that we have. We are 100% dependent on the partners within this community. Um, and particularly for this project, um, it was important that we find mutual benefits. Um, so whereas we look at things maybe from the watershed health or water quality aspect, um, your sewer utility or MS4, when we walk into their, those doors, we are talking to them about infrastructure risk reduction, right? Um, when we're out in the community and we're talking with cities, we've got you know a dozen or so different cities within our watershed said the county or even the transportation cabinet to them we talk about roadway protection you know preventing the the uh, repairs necessary for stabilizing the creeks along all their different city and county roads and even um, private property owners we have countless property owners coming in saying you know hey you know i just lost you know four feet of my backyard over the last five years or so well you know for them the, these these projects provide a benefit of of reducing that property loss and erosion of their 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 land and like i said um the the bank Lake watershed council we we are dependent on partners and so you know our approach to partnership building within urbanized areas is is really to take a collaborative approach versus confrontational. Now, if you talk to some of the guys down at SD1, they, they, they will say that I cause problems sometimes, but I really try and do things in a way that benefits um, our organization, our shared goals for improving the creeks. Um, it's also important that when you, when you develop partnerships that you present sound, sustainable solutions that are um, fiscally responsible, right? You can't have um, outlandish costs for some of these things. It's got to, the costs have to be justified. You have to be able to speak their language to equate what we want to do with how that will benefit them and their rate payers or taxpayers. The other thing we try and do as a watershed council is we really try and provide value. Okay, we walk in and we are offering our expertise and our time. A lot of these agencies don't have excess personnel sitting around able to, you know, tackle some of these issues. When we come in, we are there, we are offering, you know, to, hey, we can do some of this extra legwork, you know, we can identify some of these projects. We also support ourselves with an experienced team of consultants for design engineer and construction. And so we try to really make sure that that what we bring to the table has value to the partners that we're working with at the time. Um, so with that, I just I need to say a special thanks to Matt Wooten at SD1. I think he's on the, the call today. Um, it's his research and his team with with Bob Holly at Sustainable Streams, Katie McManus, also Sustainable Streams, um, and Chris Russ that have really allowed us the understanding that we need to proceed with some of these projects. So um, they've spent years and years on this research. And so I just, I owe them a debt of gratitude to be able to utilize the information that they've been able to put together over those years. <laughs>